that God will work it out. Matthew chapter 6. God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for working it out. Thank you because you've already worked it out. We pray your blessings upon this moment of worship. I've studied, but I need your spirit. I prepared, but I need your power. Speak, Lord. We've heard your word through song. We heard it through prayer, but now we hear it through sermon. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. You're able to stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 6. Uh, this week we're looking at verses 28 through 29. This is how my Bible reads from the New International Version. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this, is how God's, if this is how God clothed the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Is that in essence what your Bible say? I want to talk from this subject as we continue in this. I'm free from again worry. It's above me now. Look around at somebody and tell them, I'm free from worry. It's above me now. You may be seated even in the presence of the Lord. In 2019, a tragic moment that involved a phrase turned into the saying of the summer that year after a video surfaced of a woman calling a black man a racial slur. Most of us remember this incident and in some instances still use the saying to this very day. Craig Brooks, an employee of a Holiday Inn Express in Austin, Texas, took the phone call that day that made him famous overnight. While trying to assist a woman in making a reservation, she became belligerent, disrespectful, and even hostile. And because of her disposition, Craig Brooks, trying to do his job, remain uh, mannerable, referred the individual to the automatic, automatic reservation line. However, the lady continued to be disrespectful. He asked if there was anything else that he could do for her, and he paused, and as he paused for her response, an article stated that Brooks said she didn't think that I was on the phone with her anymore because her husband said something, and she yelled this racial slur, and I said, excuse me? When I said, excuse me, Brooks said she hung up. He called upper management and explained the incident, and in return, upper management told Brooks that the Holiday Inn had zero tolerance for racism, and if she called again, he could refuse her stay. No less than five minutes after that call to upper management, the individual walked through the door, and at that moment, Brooks decided to record everything. She pleaded with Brooks to find the room, apologized somewhat for the racial slur, and even stated that the reason she acted in that manner was because of the death of a family member. Brooks noted all of that, Still denied her service at the hotel, but what made him famous was when he responded, Ma'am, I understand, but it's above me now. She begged and pleaded. However, Brooks remained consistent, stood his ground, and said, Ma'am, I understand. It's above me now. 
and even referred her to the best Western next door. That statement, it's above me now, literally became the anthem for 2019. Because for many, that sense of unbotheredness resonated with so many because it quickly became a symbol of the need for one to conserve their energy, conserve their composure, mental stability, and even peace during stressful and chaotic situations. This was something that not just black and brown people were using because they too might have experienced a similar situation, but it was a phrase that everyone was using in 2019 because when things were happening beyond one's control, beyond one's understanding, capacity, and might I even add, pay grade. It's above me now became something that people use because of instead of becoming overtaken by unnecessary worry and stress, it's above me now became that phrase that reminded us all that some things are out of your hands and since they are out of your hands, let the appropriate superior with the wherewithal handle the given situation. While putting this message together this week, it's above me now, kept coming to the forefront of my mind because I found myself worried about something and right before I allowed it to defeat, dampen my mood and deplete the joy that I had, I prayed and in my prayer, I literally said these words to God, God, this is on you. Amen. And having that resolve was not because the issue was irrelevant, nor was it because I didn't care about the issue, but I developed that resolve this week because I'm starting to look at worry and stress differently. I I'm beginning now to discover that just like anything else in my life and in this world, worry is a choice that we can take on, or should I suggest, control our lives. Yes, whether you believe this or not, worry is something that you and I choose to take on or not at any moment in life. Though it is a natural emotional response and though depending on the circumstances, it's hard for us not to do. Worry Church is a never-ending process that constructs this feeling to find solutions, to find answers to questions that are in some regard impossible to answer even with 100% certainty. It's that reaction, worry that is, that causes repetitive and unpleasant thoughts to swirl inside our heads, invade our consciousness, completely disregarding the fact that at times we probably already addressed the issue numerous times before. Beloved, it's something, worry, that we have an option to choose. I lift this morning that worry is a choice. Because what does worry change when you think about it? I mean, for a moment, think about how profitable it is to worry anyway. And when you think about it, I'm sure that you'll discover that it doesn't actually do anything meaningful to affect or to alter tomorrow. Instead, the only significant thing worry does is rob us of living and enjoying today. Oddly enough, most of the things that we worry about are future events or outcomes, watch this, that never actually happen. <laughs> when we worry, we do as this Swedish proverb states around this notion of worry. When we worry, church, we often give a small thing a big shadow. And I was led to take this time last week and this week to unpack this idea of being free from worry, not suggesting or submitting that immediately after hearing these sermons, we would instantly remove this urge to worry. But I wanted to dive into this to cause us as believers to think of the alternative. My aim was and is this week to strongly get us to focus on our faith that we so heavily promote in church 
to focus on our faith in God because if we claim that we are children of God, then we are instructed to have total confidence in that God. And if we have total confidence in that God, then worry and faith are not synonymous. Our faith, St. John's, in God should allow us to be free from the burden and the bondage of worry because we don't have to trust or rely in or on our own abilities to take care of everything in our lives. I suggest this morning that because believers are children of God, created by God after God's likeness and image, then it's God's responsibility to ensure that every need is met because Paul states in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8 that God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work. Our dependence on God beloved, our trust in God's ability to control both heaven and earth lifts up the weight of worry that so easily besets us and reroutes the energy and causes us to say to God, I'm putting this in your hands and since it's in your hands, it's above me now. If you don't take away anything from this sermon, hear this point once again. Our dependence on God's ability to control both heaven and earth should lift up this weight of worry, that thing that so easily besets us, reroutes that energy and causes us to say to God, in essence, I'm putting this in your hands. And since it's in your hands, it's above me now. Come on, do I have any witnesses who can testify that this week alone you had some stuff to come up? You didn't know how you were going to handle it. You didn't know where the money was going to come from. You didn't know how the outcome was going to turn out. But you said to God one day, God, this is on you. It's in your hands. And since it's in your hands, I am going to take my hands off of it, and it's above me now. Several, several vital principles have been lifted since Jesus taught his most, or since Jesus began, rather, his most famous Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Since Matthew primarily writes to a Jewish audience, there are many ways his gospel captures the attention of those of Jewish heritage. And one of the ways it's done is how he structures his gospel. Y'all remember me telling you that Matthew writes to primarily a Jewish audience through Jewish scripture about a Jewish God who sent a Jewish Jesus to this world, right? And so one of the ways Matthew captures the attention of his Jewish audience is how he structures things in his gospel. For instance, many of the Jews believed in or on the law of Moses. And the law of Moses constituted five books, the Pentateuch, you know, Genesis, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Exodus, you know, the five books, right? So Matthew decides, all right, if the law of Moses is made up of five books, I'm going in my gospel to contain five major sermons of Jesus. And the Sermon on the Mount is one of the most famous and not offered as a plan to salvation for the unbeliever. The Sermon on the Mount instead was a teaching moment for those who had decided to dedicate themselves to being disciples. And it was a constitution that was set for the lives to be governed by. One more time. The Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, all of that beautiful stuff was not a plan for salvation. Instead, it's the constitution that the disciple, the one who decides to dedicate themselves to Christ, should live their lives by. All right? For Jesus, 
to be his disciple, then it involved more than just a verbal statement of commitment. There needed to be some visible and even visceral demonstrations of that commitment. Y'all want me to say it again? Y'all got quiet. That means you're listening or have you gone to sleep? All right. You know, I just want to make sure, you know. I want to make sure. For Jesus, in order to be his disciple, it involves more than just this verbal statement of commitment. It, and in times, requires some visible and even visceral, V-I-S-C-E-R-A-L, visceral, inner demonstration of that commitment. With topics like giving to the needy, prayer, fasting, and commitment, it would seem that as Jesus continues his teaching in chapter 6, he furthers his discussion around worry. This thing, this worry, this anxiety and stress would constitute, if one lets it go, it would constitute how one viscerally, inwardly commits themselves to being a disciple. To be Jesus' disciple requires this inward confidence that even when it comes to matters that are essential to our survival, things like food, drink, and even clothing, it's this inward, this visceral confidence that says these words, God takes care of us. And God will never allow us to go without. So self, don't worry. All right? In his teaching, I love it, I love it, I love it. In his teaching, Jesus seeks to cultivate and strengthen the faith of those who are in the crowd. However, Jesus is not oblivious to who's in the crowd. As he's talking to his audience, Jesus is aware that there are several types of people in the audience. He's aware that firstly there are people listening to him who've decided to pick up their crosses, deny themselves, and follow him. But he understands that that set of people, those people, also are folk who are living in poverty. Thus, worry for them as it relates to necessities is commonplace. Among him, some found it challenging to keep food in the house, let alone find food and properly fitting clothing. They were worried about where the day's meal would come from, and not just tomorrow's meal, but right now meal. And perhaps because a myriad of factors, including not being a part of the beloved community, a community that collectively took care of each other because everyone shared in the earth's wealth. In the earth's wealth, they carried that load of worry. Because they did not have the privilege of knowing or living in the beloved community where poverty, hunger, and homelessness would not be tolerated because standards of human decency would not allow it. These individuals found themselves worried over things which if we want to be honest this morning, they had a legitimate right to do as such. He understood that in the crowd, there are people who were scraping to make ends meet. He understood that there were people who were barely working enough hours, barely receiving enough pay, barely able to take care of their families, but he tells them, but don't you worry. And I'm sure that it did not sit right with some of them. How, how can this preacher tell me not to worry? He doesn't live on the street that I live. He doesn't know what it's like for me to be in want. He doesn't know what it's like for me to get to a gas station to only be able to afford 5 or $10 and pray to God that that 5 or $10 get me from point A to point B to point C, back to point A, back to B, back to C, back to point A, back to B, back to C all this week because I ain't got no more money. He doesn't know what it's like but yes he does 
But also as he's teaching, Jesus also aware, is also aware that there were folks in the crowd who very well had the means to provide these essentials, yet they worried anyway. Those who choose to worry, worried about food, drink, and clothing, not because it was a present worry. Instead, for many, it was a future worry. Within this crowd, some worried about what they would eat, drink, and wear tomorrow. And tomorrow represented days, weeks, and even years down the road. They worried and stressed to ensure that they had for the future because they feared that they would end up in a state of not having. However, with these two groups of people in the audience, Jesus understands primarily that their worries stem from a point of their lack of faith. And for Jesus, their lack of faith in God was an insult. And it proved that they were not verbally, visibly, or viscerally committed as they claimed. Therefore, Jesus wants them and us to see that the things we worry about our upper management's responsibility to handle. So it's above us now. All right, here we go. I got three things, and I promise you I'm done. First of all, it's above us now, worry that is, because God is concerned with creation. God is concerned with his creation. In verse 25, Jesus stated, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. And two concerns were lifted as common factors of worry. He lives food and clothing. And as he continues through this text, Jesus offered illustrations from nature to make things make sense. He firstly used the image of birds which dealt with the need for food. He says that birds, these animals in the air, they do not have the capabilities of sowing, reaping, or storing food like humans. Yet he says, but your heavenly father feeds them. He, he used that illustration to show how when it comes to food, if God is concerned with making sure that the birds don't suffer from hunger, then humans who are more valuable, useful, and precious to that same God, won't God, I know that's improper English, won't God <laughs> ensure we are provided for? All right? If, if God can make sure that the little bird that flies in the air will have food for today, tomorrow, and even weeks down the road. If God is that much concerned by a little bird, then how much more is God concerned about you? But in verse 28, Jesus comes to his second illustration, which is centered around clothing. This time, Jesus begins with a question, and then he goes into his example. He asks, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. Both examples seem to convey once again that those who serve, love, and are committed to God are committed to a God who will every time and all the time prove why being committed to him matters. It matters because no matter the need, God's hand will always supply. Now, I know, I know that sounds so cliche-ish and so churchy and, and so, in a sense, unrealistic. But when you really live <laughs> in total confidence in your God, I'm putting it back on you. 
the God you come here Sunday after Sunday clapping for, shouting for, praising for, singing for, all that good stuff. When you really put your faith in that God, then you live by this. God supplies all of my needs. I, I'm telling you, it's the God honest truth. God supplies every one of our needs, but I think the issue is we try to want things from God, and God says some of the stuff you've been wanting you don't need, but I'll make sure that your needs are met. Whether it be what we place in our stomachs or what we put on our backs, it's God's responsibility to worry about and not yours. And God will honor God's commitment always. Even when we don't stick to our end of the contract. God will never not follow through with his. Dealing with this clothing piece, Jesus encourages his audience to consider King James Version. I love it. It says the lilies in the field. I believe he does this uh, because clothes were essential in this day. And even in our day, clothes are essential. I mean, let's be honest. Regardless of the brands, the colors, and other factors, we need clothes. We need them. Um, however, for Jesus, though it is a need, there were those in his audience who were overconsumed with the idea of clothing either because they did not have, in a sense, proper clothing, or they did have it, but they continued to stress over having more than enough. Jesus says, consider the lilies of the field. And, and it seems to stand for all types of wildflower, fly, wild flowers that probably grew in the meadows of Galilee, but it also suggests that Jesus is mainly talking about the purple anemones that grew in the field, these purple lilies. Jesus wants us to, to, to think about several factors about them. He wants us, first of all, to consider their loveliness, their beauty. Jesus was really talking about these lilies in the field, then those flowers were simply beautiful. They were so beautiful that even Jesus places them in connection with Solomon's garments, who the Bible tells us that Solomon was arrayed in so many beautiful linens and clothing. These flowers were adorned with such splendor that Jesus says in verse 20, yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these flowers. However, though these flowers, in a sense, are clothed in beauty, I'm almost where I need to be, the question arises: then how did their beauty come about? How were the flowers able to be dressed in such splendor? And Jesus states in verse 29, he says, they neither spin nor labor. So how are they clothed in such beauty? These flowers, which have no benefit of being grown by humans in a nursery, are not capable of working that's laboring or producing cloth that's spinning of any sort to account for their clothing. Let, yet Jesus asked us to consider them because although they weren't able to do for themselves, they're still clothed in such beauty. But how? Here's the answer. God takes care of them that time. It is because of the concern and creativity of God for what he has created that allows the lilies of the field to be adorned with such beauty. And if God can recognize the beauty of flowers, then how much more will God make sure that you and I are clothed? Here it is. Look at their loveliness. But then consider their longevity. Let church say longevity. When you read, uh, continue reading, Jesus challenges us, church, to look at the lilies, not just because of their beauty, but he also wants us to consider their fragility. In verse 30, Jesus wants us to really ask ourselves the question of how much more? Especially we, when we consider the lifespan of flowers. Based on Jesus, though these flowers are beautiful, I'm writing the text, 
their beauty is short-lived because they can be in the field today but cast in the fire tomorrow to be used for baking bread. And all Jesus wants us to think about is this. If God provides for them, then how much more will God provide for those who contain the very breath of God that enables them to become living souls? While you are worried about clothes, when you can be here today in clothes and gone tomorrow in clothes and don't even know that you got clothes on when you laying stretched out in a casket if God can take care of lilies in the field how much more can God take care of you he wants us to consider God's concern for his creation look at the lilies loveliness look at the flowers longevity but then he points it back to our loyalty Jesus asks at the end of verse 30, or says at the end of verse 30, and he brings the problem to the forefront. This is the first time Jesus really brings this problem. He says the reason for our worry about food and clothing is because we are of little faith. It's right there in the text. Jesus states, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Jesus forces his audience and us to really think about our level of faith in God who proves over and over again that he is concerned with creation. Now, I must suggest to you this morning, I must lift this, that Jesus is not belittling, belittling or scolding his audience. Instead, he's encouraging them upward. <laughs> he's calling them to grow their faith to the level where they can fully know that they can trust in God's ability to provide. Oh, ye <laughs> of little faith. Can, can I push this thing a little further? Um, while our faith is in question when we worry, I also believe that there's another factor in question. You want to know what it is? Our worth. Faith is in question, but our worth is also in question. How do you say that, Pastor? Because Jesus just doesn't instruct us to consider the birds in the air or the flowers in the field as an exhortation to trust the Father. It's also an affirmation to see our great worth through God's eyes. Y'all miss where to shout. All right. You don't trust in God just so that you can show off your faith. That if God takes care of birds in the air and flowers in the field, then you ought to trust God. No, 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 no. It's not just an exhortation to trust, but it's also an affirmation to show us how much worthy we are in God's eyes. You and I are so valuable in God's eyes than birds and flowers. And if you don't know how much you're worth, it's not because God hasn't proven it. It's because we've allowed ourselves to believe otherwise. I think the issue of worry for the believer stems from the fact that we've allowed so many other factors, so many other voices, so many other forces to diminish our worth to ourselves and to God. We've allowed the comments of people who shared and said that we are nothing and nobody to diminish our worth. But if you were growing up like I grew up, my granddaddy told me something about Jesse Jackson. He said, while Jesse Jackson is a preacher. Jesse would always begin his push coalition by saying, tell your neighbor, I am somebody. I may be black, but I'm somebody. I may be short, but I'm somebody. And it just wasn't something to push the crowd, but it was something for the crowd to internalize. That in a climate and culture that's diminishing our worth, the worth of black and brown bodies, the worth of women, the worth of our intellect, the worth of our creativity tell yourself I am somebody yeah. 
Bernard Hopkins, an African-American professional boxer stated, if you don't know your own value, somebody will tell you your value and it'll be less than what you're worth. Preach pass. If you don't know your own value, somebody else will tell you your value and it will be less than what you're worth. But look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor, I know who I'm is. Say it just like that. Say it just like that. I know who I'm is. You ain't, you ain't got to tell me that. It's good when you come back and confirm what I already know. But every morning I wake up, I tell myself I am somebody. I am wonderfully and fearfully made. I am the righteousness of God. I know how much I'm worth. And even when folk don't know, I know how much I'm worth to God. God's concern for us is not just because we are his creation. It's deeper than that. God is much more concerned about us because we are his children. These flowers, thank you Candace, they're not real, but if they were real. These flowers are God's creation. But you and I, because we have the breath of God created in his image, created in his likeness, we weren't just created, but we have the privileges of being called his children. And like any good parent will do, they'll make sure that they bend over backwards to make sure that their child has what they need. Can I tell you the issue? Can I really be honest with you? We have allowed the cares of the world to cause us to forget the how much mores of God. We've allowed our worry to cause us to forget the how much more of God. God says, he asked us through Jesus, listen, ask yourself if I take care of the birds in the air, lilies of the field, then how much more will I take care of you? It, it shows us that it's above us now because God is concerned with his creation and children. But it also shows us that God is cognizant of the concern. Look at verse 31 and 32. Um, Jesus returns to his initial challenge from verse 25, and he states in verse 31, so do not worry, saying what we shall eat or what we shall drink or what we shall wear. And he does this to stress that worry is pointless. And it proves that one is not a part of the kingdom of God. How so, Pat? Well, he's saying that when we worry, continue reading, we do like the Gentiles. Or in essence, those who have no relationship with God, those who are not connected and committed, verse 32 says, they run after such needs. The Gentiles, or in some translations, the pagans, are the ones who bend over backwards to ensure that they, are, that they have everything they need. These are they who strive for independence and who fail to trust anyone. You see, to Jesus, worry was downright pagan. It was the attitude of one who was not a part of the kingdom of God. They did not believe in God, which meant that they did not believe that God was cognizant or aware of what was happening. Jesus stresses that we do not need to worry because it's pointless for a child of God. How so, Pastor? It's because if you keep reading, if you have not closed your Bible... It's pointless for us to worry when your heavenly father knows that you need. <laughs> there is nothing that God doesn't know. God is well aware of everything we need. Therefore, since God is cognizant of that, let 
it be God's concern to ensure we have what we need. God is so aware that of what we need that in verse 8 of this same chapter, Jesus reminded the disciples, your father knows what you have need of even before you ask him. If, if scripture tells us that we serve a God who is aware of the number of hairs that are on our head, the years we live, and the path we should take, then how much more is God aware of every need? Do me a favor, get acquainted with your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor, God knows. Come on, put your preaching voice on and tell him, neighbor, God knows. Yes, sir. <laughs> This is not the first time we needed to be reminded of how much God is aware of. In Exodus chapter 3, God was cognizant of the cries and the suffering of the children of Israel. So God sent them who they needed. He said in verse 7 of Exodus 3, the Lord said, I have heard your cries. I have seen your misery, and because of that, I am concerned about your suffering. In Exodus 16, God was cognizant that the people needed food, so he sent them what they needed. God made sure manna and quail fell from heaven. In 1 Kings chapter 17, God was aware that a woman in Zarephath, who was a widow was living on the verge of giving up but God made sure she had who and what she needed she was on her way back home to fix a last meal for her and her son she only had a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil left but when she followed after God God provided more than enough God knew how much we needed saving so God sent us who we needed for God's so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God was cognizant that there were 5,000 men excluding women and children who had decided to follow and learn of Jesus who was hungry so what did God do? God gave them what they needed. God allowed a little boy who was carrying only two fish and five loaves of bread to offer that to Jesus and God provided. Look around at somebody tell them God knows. I know folk may not know but is there anybody out there this morning who can thank God that God knows? I'm done. I'm done. But God is cognizant of the concern. God knows. Come on, help me here. God knows but then I'm done look at look at finally God's covenant is concerned is certain God's covenant is certain the reason why we can say it's above us now is because God's covenant is certain Jesus instructs us to give up the weight of worry I'm done and focus on something else he tells us listen it's above you now let upper management take care of it and he urges us to challenge our energy elsewhere and allow God to do what God does best I love Jesus because Jesus in his unique way points us back Deacon Thomasina to God's words I mean he says listen if, if, if you gonna worry then I, I'm gonna let you be worryless because I'm going to put this back on God. I'm going to put this back on God's covenant and commitment, which is certain. He says, if we trust and remain committed to God, he says in verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. In essence, Jesus says these words, if you, if you, watch this, if you put God's interest first, then God will make sure your future needs are guaranteed. This is God's covenant, and it's a sure thing.
putting off the stress and worry about life and putting on the things of God first is a sure way of making sure I have what I need. How so? Well, God always enables those who are doing his work, his way, with what they need to continue doing it. What does this look like, Pastor? He says, seek ye first the kingdom, then seek his righteousness. All right, what does it look like? I'm glad you asked. The word kingdom here is literally to mean rule or reign. A kingdom is a place where king rules. And to seek the kingdom of God is to seek the rule and the reign of God over our entire lives. It's literally saying to God, let your kingdom come. And let your will be done. Now, when you truly seek a king and his kingdom, you're automatically seeking two things. First of all, you're seeking the glory of the king. Every part and parcel of your life, every minute and every moment of your time, every ounce and pound of your strength, every muscle and fiber of your body ought to be given for the glory of God. But it also means that you seek the guidance of the king, all right? When you seek ye first the kingdom, you are seeking for the glory of the king. But you're also seeking the guidance of the king. If you are going to be a loyal subject, then a loyal subject, which I'm not telling you, I ain't going to bow down to everybody. But I will bow down. To the man who says that at the name of Jesus, uh, every knee shall bow. And as a loyal subject, all I want to do is whatever the king would have me to do. All right. there, there is no higher calling in life than to find out what your king wants done and when it's done. Every morning of your life, if you're going to seek ye first the kingdom, you should begin by asking Jesus what Paul asked on the Damascus Road. Lord, what would you have me to do today? <laughs> when you seek ye first the kingdom of God, what you're saying to God is, listen, I want to be guided by you. And here are my hands. Use me. Here are my feet. Use them. Here is my voice. Use that. Use me however you see fit. All right. But not only are we seeking first the kingdom, we're also seeking his righteousness. Lord, I've gone over time. This, this is, this is, watch this. Not only are we seeking God's control over us, Here's where I shout, I, I, I cannot crease up these J's, but we are seeking not only God's control, but we're also seeking God's character. <laughs> your kingdom is your control over me, but your righteousness is your character within me. Come on, talk to me. Y'all missing where to shout at. Your kingdom is your control, your reign, your rule over me. But seeking your righteousness is seeking your character within me. And we ought to desire to be like God. The kingdom of God is not only this inward experience, but it's all, it ought to be outwardly expressed. You see, if God is ruling over you, then his righteousness should be within you. And how can we do that, Pastor? Well, when you really think about character, you know that a person's character is simply the outward expression of whatever is controlling them inwardly. And whatever I have over me and in me, it ought to come out to show the world. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then the Bible says, then all these things will be added to you. What are the things? The things I need, of course. Things like food, things like water, things like clothing. When I pursue the things of God, God will allow the things I need to continue pursuing him to be added to me. Now here's the shout. 
with our focus on the things of the kingdom and God's righteousness. Jesus does this to show us that you ain't got no other time to worry about the future because the things of God should take up all your time. So Jesus comes back and says, so don't worry. Don't, don't, don't worry. And in fact, he says, the reason why you don't worry is because tomorrow will worry about itself. In fact, Jesus says that tomorrow has its own share of trouble. And if it has its own share of trouble, then today's worry can't handle tomorrow's trouble. If tomorrow is just all by itself, then you can only focus on today because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So instead, church, of you worrying about tomorrow, just live and ask God to give you what you need today. Give us this day. what we need and if I see tomorrow I'm going to say the same prayer give me this day and if I see the next day it ain't give me tomorrow but it's give me this day. I don't know about you I don't know about you but that which I could worry about I'm placing it in the hands of my superior I'm putting it back on upper management and since I'm putting it back on upper management, it's above me now. My responsibility is to seek after God's things. And when I do that, my things will be added to me. Because God will always keep God's word. We, we don't have to worry about things in this life because God will take care of us. Now, I'm not suggesting that you ain't got to do no work. I'm not suggesting that God's provisions will come about even in our laziness. What I am proposing is that when we do what is required of us, which is seeking ye first the kingdom of God, when we do what is required of us, which is trusting and seeking, then God will always do God's part. I'm closing my iPad right now, but my soul done caught on fire. Would you look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, do your part and watch God do the rest. Come on, look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, do your job and watch upper management take care of, of whatever you need. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I ain't worried, I ain't fearing because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Fret not thyself because of evildoers for they soon shall be cut off and wither with the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Would you look around at somebody and tell them, neighbor, when you do your part, God will do his. Come on, shake a neighbor. I got to quit, but would you look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, whenever you do your part, God will make sure you do his. Come on, find you another neighbor and tell them neighbor seek first trust first worry last because when you trust him when you seek after him God will make sure that everything that you need will come running to you do I have any company who can testify that I'm living because God has met my needs I'm working because God has met my needs. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Hey! 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 Woo! Woo!
But this morning, I'm here to tell you that it's above me now. I'm going to let God take care of it. And whatever happens, whatever comes, whatever outcome is, it's on God now because it's above me now. Come on, we're standing. I'm sorry, I just got happy. I'm sorry, I got happy, I got happy. I just got happy. I just got happy. Because God shall supply all my needs. Is there anybody here who knows that God has done it? That God is doing it? And that God will do it? Come on, we're standing if you're able to stay. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, we got to go. The doors of the Lord's church are open. I, I'm sorry, I got to have So be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care. Of, if I take care of the birds in the air and the lilies in the field, how much more will I take care of you? To those of the Lord's church are open, I, I, I'm sorry. I, if, if I can't get happy on my own preaching, then it ain't preaching. I'm sorry, I just got happy on my own. Because God has taken care of every need. Every need. So don't worry. And I know you're saying, Pastor, that is so hard for me. You don't know what I have. I understand that. But how much more does God care for you? You're not just God's creation. You're God's children. And God always takes care of his children. If you're a parent, grandparent, you, you're going to make sure that even when you don't have, your children will have. So the doors of the Lord's church are open. Maybe there's someone in here. You don't know Jesus. 